You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and the Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Dr. Jeffrey Karp. Uh, he's a professor of medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, part of uh, Harvard Medical School. We're going to be talking about a pill that could reverse type 2 diabetes, which would be huge. Uh, Dr. Jess published over 125 peer-reviewed papers, uh, with close to 20,000 citations. Amazing. He's given over 300 lectures. Uh, he's issued uh, over sorry, 100 pending patents. Uh, tremendous background here. So, uh, Jeff, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like a slacker now. I need to get going <laughs> based on all the work you've done. Sheesh. Well, t- tell me a little bit about, a little bit about your uh, your background first, if you would, and then we'll get into this, uh, this pill. Absolutely. Uh, so, I'm a chemical engineer by training. I did my, uh, my undergrad at McGill. I'm uh, I'm actually from a, a small town uh, about an hour and a half northeast of Toronto called Peterborough. Um, uh, after McGill, I uh, did my PhD in Toronto at University of Toronto, and then I I did a postdoc at MIT in uh, Bob Langer's lab um, from uh, 2004 to 2007, and then I started as a um, a faculty member um, at the Brigham of Women's Hospital through Harvard Medical School in July of 07. Um, and I've been there ever since. And I have a number of affiliations. I, I teach at MIT um, and do some, uh, some committee work and things there through the mentor student, through the um, health sciences and technology program. And then I'm also an affiliate faculty at the Broad Institute and a principal faculty at the, the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. Mm, okay. So, uh, tell me a little bit about the background of this uh, pill. You know, from from what I know, type two diabetes is it, it's just huge. It's going to be a monstrous strain on you know the U.S. healthcare system and on healthcare systems worldwide. So, what's the premise here, and how would you affect the condition? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, di- diabetes is is yeah one of uh, unbelievable um, to think of, of how much um, you know resources are put into treating patients. Um, who have diabetes, and um, this this project uh, began a number of years ago uh, when a bariatric surgeon at my institution at, at the Brigham, uh, Ali Tavacoli, um, had an had an idea, and you know about I forget exactly the time, but maybe, maybe about like in the last like ten or fifteen years ago or so, um, there was this really remarkable discovery um, from a surgery that that performed for obesity. And so uh, a type of bariatric surgery called gastric bypass, um, where essentially you reroute um, the, the gut, so food will never pass through your stomach again. And this has been a very effective treatment for obesity. And, um, you know, many patients who are obese also have type 2 diabetes. And the remarkable finding was that the patients who had the, the type 2 diabetes, who had the gastric bypass procedure, a huge percentage of them uh, did not require taking any medications to manage their diabetes immediately after the procedure. They didn't even have to wait for the weight to come down. Um, this was just like a, a, a remarkable, um, you know, change in, in, in their disease. And um, and so the um, 
there was a society for uh, for bariatric surgery actually changed their name to the Society for for uh, Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery because of this discovery. And there's been multiple papers, including in you know New England Journal of Medicine and and, and others that uh, that support this really exciting discovery. And so um, Dr. Tavacoli was. Um, you know, right in the thick of it, uh, being a bariatric surgeon, and, and he has a basic research lab dedicated to trying to understand how how the the mechanism behind you know how this works. And so he um, was interested in seeing if there was a way to to do this more minimally invasively because bariatric surgery is is just so invasive. You know, the, to reroute your gut and then you know even like psychologically, you know, food will never go past your stomach. It's a it's a lot to to stomach, if you will. Um, and, uh, and so there, but there's a lot of side effects and, and very few, you have to have a very high, um, BMI, uh, to qualify, uh, for this procedure. So most people who could benefit actually don't qualify. And even if you do qualify, the side effects are just so severe, um, that, uh, you know, a lot of people don't go through with it. And so he was interested in thinking about, you know, is it possible to, to try to achieve the same, um, response in a more minimally invasive way, and maybe you know, is there possible to develop a pill that you could swallow that could kind of do something similar? And so, uh, so he went and spoke to uh, uh, Dr. Fred Schoen at the Brigham, uh, who's the vice chair of pathology, and, and I've known Dr. Schoen for a while. And so he connected both of us, and we started talking, and and that really led to this this collaboration to develop a more minimally invasive way um, to uh, to treat type two diabetes. Um, through a very similar principle through which this uh, this gastric bypass procedure works. Well, what do you think is the? Uh, I'll ask you. What do you think the mechanism is, mechanism is? But before that, what changes? Is it that the person's blood sugars are in control all of a sudden? Is it that? Uh, I mean, is there some other effect? How do you know that the diabetes has been mitigated? Do they not need to take insulin? What happened? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So there's a dramatic drop in the requirements for um, taking medications to manage glucose levels. Uh, and so they basically just start dropping immediately after these um, surgeries are performed. Yeah. So when you do gastric bypass, the food comes in, but it doesn't go into the stomach at all, right? There's no smaller yeah. pseudo stomach that's made, or is it, does it just start going to the large intestine? Oh, sorry, the small intestine? Yeah, so essentially, you know, kind of simply stated, what what, what happens is is the um, the gut is rerouted, so the stomach is still there and the stomach is still attached, but there's actually just nothing going into the stomach. And so what happens is is that any food that you eat will bypass the stomach and essentially enter instead of going through the stomach, it, it enters the kind of later part of of the GI tract, kind of you know down in in deep kind of into the duodenum. Um, and so the stomach is still there and, you know, it's still active, but there's just no food that will ever, ever contact it again. And so really what's, what's happening is that you're isolating the contact of nutrients with the stomach and the first part of, of the duodenum, which is the part of the intestine, you know, just right when you exit the, the stomach. And so what we did is we developed um, a pill that you could swallow um, that would provide a temporary coating on the exact same region that you isolate with gastric bypass procedures. And that coating is um, impermeable to nutrients, so it actually blocks nutrient absorption just in the first part of the GI tract. The nutrients can still be absorbed kind of later down, but just can't be absorbed in, in that region. Um, and, um, and so we've done a, a series of experiments, uh, many experiments, um, and demonstrated that we can significantly um, alter the ability to absorb um, glucose. And essentially, we see about a 45 to 50% reduction um, in the, the glucose that we're able to detect in the blood when we pre-administer this, this pill that we've created. So what's missing out on the digestive process when you bypass the stomach? So you're going right into the, you said the duodenum? Yeah, yeah. What so, would typically happen in the stomach? Like, how how does the body still process food if you're missing out on the uh, the stomach acid churning digestive part? Sure. Yeah. So so there's you know as you you've um, highlighted you know there's lots of lots of enzymes that are present in the stomach and a lot of um, you know it's a very dynamic environment. So you're kind of breaking down um, a lot of the the foods and into uh, soluble forms that could then be digested. And so if you bypass the stomach, 
um, then you reduce the amount of nutrients essentially that can be that can be absorbed. Um, and this is, you know, one of the ways that, that uh, gastric bypass procedures are able to treat obesity um, is that, y you know, y you, y and, and then there's also a component where you, you end up being a little less hungry um, because of this, but, but you actually end up, um, you know, not being able to absorb as many calories, you know, kind of sim simply stated. Um, now, food can still be, nutrients can still be absorbed in the GI tract, uh, but you just don't have the same efficiency as as you would if if the stomach was there. Well, there are certain classes of nutrients that appear not to be digested. Like you know, it may be gross, but has anyone taken fecal samples from people with gastric bypass and profiled what the you know the feces look like, what the composition versus someone that has a regular digestive uh, pathway? Yeah, no, I think I think these studies have been done. I I, I haven't uh, gone through those specific studies in in detail, but I'm sure my collaborator, um, you know, uh, Dr. Tabacoli is, is is familiar with with those types of studies. I think um, you know, getting back to, to to the mechanism question, it's 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 interesting because the mechanism is not really fully defined. You know, how gastric bypass procedure is is you you know how it can actually work um, to uh, to treat type two diabetes. Uh, but we, we do know, you know, there's a lot of different things that can be at play. One is if you delay nutrient absorption to kind of further down the GI tract, um, you start to see um, incretins like GLP-1 and GLP-2 start to be secreted. Um, and, um, and that can have a positive benefit as well. And there's, you know, some biology that's happening in the first part of the GI tract that, that appears to be a bit out of whack. There's sweet taste receptors that exist there and, and you know, other types of receptors that... Um, you know, in, uh, on, on the surface of cells, and, the, you know, there could be, um, and, and a lot of this is kind of speculative right now just because the biology is, you know, being worked out, but, you know, we think that there's some, some, some kind of um, irregular biology happening in the first part of the GI tract, and, and that if you can isolate that with gastric bypass procedure, um, that, that this can, can actually help. And so what we've done is we actually created a, a pill um, that you could take, you know, right before a meal or two or three hours before a meal, for example. Um, and what this does is it forms a transient coating um, and uh, that can limit nutrient absorption. And then it's a, a very safe material that we've um, developed that can then just transit through the GI tract. It's not absorbed, um, and then it can just be, uh, be excreted. Oh, so I'd be able to take this pill and then eat, like, you know, theoretically a piece of chocolate cake and it probably wouldn't affect me adversely, blood sugar wise, let's say, or or otherwise. Yeah, so I, I think you know that that that's the concept that you would take it before a meal. We'd be able to significantly limit the contact of nutrients with the proximal or you know first part of the the GI tract, and that this would then replicate the beneficial effects of of gastric bypass uh, procedures on uh, on type two diabetics. But how do you know that this would nullify the action of the stomach portion, you know, what if it nullifies the stomach and uh, a large part of the small intestine function and therefore so little nutrients are involved or such a skewed profile of them as to cause problems for a patient? You know, how do you know that this emulates uh, bypass? Yeah, so we, we actually have some other um, kind of data points from other groups um, who have been developing um, you know, various technologies. There's a, a company called GI Dynamics that has uh, an endoluminal sleeve um, that they endoscopically place um, into the, the, the distal part of the stomach, and then it unfolds 60 centimeters into the duodenum. And so in that case, um, the stomach is still functional, the food still contacts the stomach, but you just essentially are isolating 60 centimeters of duodenum, and they were able to mimic uh, many of the beneficial effects of, of gastric bypass procedures on um, type 2 diabetics. That they ran into some challenges, which they're trying to work out right now, because the um, the system is anchored uh, into the stomach. The stomach's very dynamic, and the anchor started kind of shifting around. So they ran into complications with how that um, device, you know, kind of stays in place. Um, and um, and so you know they achieved I believe it was a one year uh, ap approval to to be placed into patients for for one year but then they ran into some complications and so now they're I think in the process of kind of iterating their technology but I think the point here is that they've demonstrated you know their their um, technology supports this idea that if you isolate you don't have to isolate the stomach you just have to isolate 
um, a segment of the duodenum. And so what we can do with our pill is we can design it so that it will selectively open and, and release the content into the duodenum so that it doesn't, doesn't contact the stomach. Um, and then we can form our you know, very thin mucoadhesive um, coating that can be uh, um, that can help reduce nutrient absorption in that same region of the GI tract. Mm. Um, I've spoken to another company. I don't remember their name, but they 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 were talking about gastric bypass. They had thought that it's because of the microbial constituent of the stomach and of the small intestine that they gave the benefits of bypass. You know, so when you eat food that goes to the stomach, essentially it becomes an aerobic environment and anaerobic environment pretty quickly. You know, no oxygen. But they said when a bypass was done, it appeared that oxygen was preserved and carried through to the small intestine, and therefore it, it changed the microbial constituent of the uh, of the bacteria there. You are you looking all at the at the gut bacteria and see how they're affected by uh, this coating? Yeah. So we we've started to look into that. I think um, you know clearly the field of uh, gut microbiota is, is um, really exciting and and um, a lot of resources are being put into that uh, that space, both you know on the academic side as well as the clinical side. I think there is uh, you know we're really just kind of at the beginning of, of that field and trying to understand how uh, the the microbes in the gut actually um, you know play a part in our physiology and you know in, in disease states. I think it may be a little too early right now to be able to. Um, you know, ha have anything conclusive that we can say, although we do know that it's, you know, extremely active and it seems to be involved in, in, in lots and lots of different biological processes and there's a lot of communications with the immune system and with the epithelium of the, the intestine. So, you know, there's likely something there, but I think it's probably just a little too early to be able to, to um, conclusively say, you know, that, that um, microbes have a very specific role um, but I think it's an intriguing hypothesis, and, and you know, over time we'll, we'll we'll definitely hear more about you know what what's actually going on. Well, what happens in uh, in a patient that gets gastric bypass? You said that you know their need for insulin, for instance, goes way down. Um, does that last for a while, or does that slowly taper off, and do they return to their uh, the diabetic state over time after the surgery? Yeah, I think you know most patients, it's a it's a durable response, um, and so they you know some some even venture to call it a cure for for certain patients um, of their their type two um, diabetes. Um, you know, there's patients who be taking four or five drugs um, to manage uh, their type two, and and after the gastric bypass procedure, they they haven't required taking. Um, uh, you know, any drugs for years. And so I think, you know, there's a, a spectrum of patients and responses, but the majority of patients um, have a very robust, durable response. Yeah. In terms of this pill, um, I don't know, is there any worry that people would abuse it, you know, in an attempt to, uh, you know, not just for diabetes, but they want to lose weight? So it's kind of like bulimia in a way or, you know, anorexia. Uh, you know, you, you eat and you throw up with bulimia, but here you just take the pill before you eat every single time, and therefore you're not absorbing the nutrients. You eat what you want, but uh, you know you're essentially undernourished because of the lack of uh, nutrient absorption. Is there any worry there? Um, well, I think that uh, you know, you, with, with any drug that you bring to market, you know, there's always concern about you know how the drug is used and and whether it can be misused. I think more of a, an issue is, is compliance and making sure people take their medications at the right time. And, and um, you know, there's a bunch of um, apps and, and different strategies that are being developed now. In fact, there's even, there's a company, Proteus, which has a really cool technology on a pill, which can, you know, potentially ping, you know, your, your cell phone to tell you, you know, remind you to take the pill. And, and it, 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 you know, if you um, take the pill, it knows. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of really innovative technologies that are being developed um, for compliance. And I think that tends to be a, a bigger issue for, for, for most drugs, not all drugs clearly, but, but for most drugs rather than um, for misuse. And I think, you know, we're advancing this along a, a drug path um, we believe that um, we're, we're actually are, are what, what we've developed is um, based on a drug that already exists on the market, which um, we were able to modify to get it to work for this purpose. purpose. Uh, it's actually a compound called sucrophate. It's been used in millions of patients for duodenal and, and gastric ulcers, and it coats selectively binds to the ulcers 
um, and has a number of beneficial effects. Um, and patients take it for months, usually like a you know one gram pill, like three four times a day. It's extremely safe and not absorbed. And we just modified that uh, the sucrophate uh, with some very simple modifications so that it could coat healthy gut tissue um, and that we could deliver it directly to the um, to the duodenum. And um, and you know we're advancing this. Uh, along a, uh, a 505B2 pathway uh, through uh, FDA, and so we're taking the drug route, um, which you know doesn't doesn't completely abolish the potential for misuse, but I think you know there's a lot less chance for misuse when you have a regulated drug that requires prescription from a doctor. Um, but yeah, you know, actually, what, what, but one one other point I think may be important to mention is that we we think that this. Um, this material could also be used as a treatment for obesity and, and for weight loss. Uh, we've been taking, you know, really close look at that. Um, we think that type 2 diabetes is a much better, you know, uh, application to go after um, early on just um, based on uh, the market and based on the, a, you know, the need and as well as uh, the process to get, get it uh, through clinical trials. Um, but we are also, um, you know, very interested in exploring the opportunity of using this um, for, for weight loss. Uh, but we really see that as more of something that we'll go after in, in, in the future because we're very focused right now on, on type 2 diabetes. Um, also, I will, will add that, that this material is very intriguing for, for drug delivery as well uh, because the material is a paste and there's very few pastes in medicine outside of you know, craniofacial or, or dental medicine. And so we're delivering like a thin adhesive coating um, to the GI tract um, that is a, really a paste consistency. So what that does is actually moves really slowly through the GI tract. And so we can incorporate all kinds of drugs into the material. And as it transits through the GI tract, it stays in close contact um, with the epithelium and it can then release these drugs. And so we can believe that we can enhance the delivery of many different types of drugs by keeping them in close contact with the intestine, uh, you know, for, for long periods of time, which has been a, a big challenge for the drug industry. Well, that brings up a good question. How is this going to affect the delivery and absorption of other drugs that people take, especially with meals? You know, that, that might be a consideration. If this slows their absorption or changes the profile or you know, if uh, a certain drug someone takes is normally absorbed, let's say, quickly in the stomach, but now slowly throughout the whole digestive system, I would think that would change the effects of that drug in them dramatically. Yeah, so, so um, whether there um, a pr pretty simple way around that, which is the um, people can take their drugs before they take. So, for example, you know, you could, you could take, take your medication um, during times of the day that are separate from when you would take this um, this. This, this pill that we're developing. And so the idea is that, um, you know, you could take um, meds, you know, a few hours before, a couple hours before you would take this um, Lucy, we call it, luminal coating of the intestine um, to, uh, to reduce nutrient absorption. And so um, certainly it, it'd be important to um, time the medication appropriately, but we believe if you time it appropriately that you really shouldn't shouldn't have any issues for that. And there's a, actually a lot of evidence in the literature to suggest that's the case. What about tuning the uh, the coating so that it acts, you know, further upstream or downstream or acts more strongly or less strongly? Absolutely. Um, and this is something that we've thought a lot about and we've developed some strategies to do it. Um, we can place the um, material into a capsule and then have a coating on the capsule, um, which is pH responsive. And uh, there's a material called Eudragite, which is very commonly used in, in pharma products to deliver drugs directly to the colon or to the duodenum or to other places in the GI tract. And so we can leverage materials that already exist within um, other types of pills and capsules um, and essentially just combine it with our agent so we can deliver directly to the duodenum if we want or we could deliver directly to the colon. Um, so we can we can control uh, and target this material uh, appropriately. I just, I would think that, you, again, you'd have to look at how the nutrient absorption profile changes, what's absorbed, what's not selectively, and then you'd be able to tune this and make it a lot more effective or a lot more selective in certain cases for people. Exactly, yes. And, and that's, uh, you know, one of the things that we uh, are looking into as we plan the clinical development, um, you know, pathway for uh, for this drug. Well, like a whole other idea would be what about people that have gluten intolerance or sensitivity or other allergies? Perhaps you could tune this so that they'd be less prone to absorb 
uh, whatever causes them problems when they have those foods. And therefore, they'd be more protected and less likely to have adverse reactions because of this coating. It's a whole other area. A- absolutely, yeah. And in fact, I actually have celiac disease, so I have a gluten intolerance. And um, and and uh, your question is something I've been thinking about as well. And, and you know, we've, we've spoken to some food allergy experts um, about the potential of using this, and, and we think there, there's definitely some opportunities here. I think what will really depend on is how severe someone's allergy is. And there's actually a lot of food allergies where there's a certain threshold. You know, people can have small amounts of certain things, but if they have a larger amount, um, then they have a reaction. And we think for cases like that, you know, we might be able to reduce the um, the antigens that are causing these, um, you know, immune responses, we may be able to reduce them just enough so that, you know, people may be able to in- enjoy certain foods and not have to worry about um, having a reaction. Yeah, a lot of possibilities. So w- where are you at with the uh, approval process? Like, what are the steps ahead of you in order to get this approved by FDA? Yeah, so we've um, we've licensed the technology into the company, which is called uh, Ultrix Bio. Um, we're based uh, in uh, in Cambridge, uh, near Kendall Square, um, within an incubator called Nest Bio. Um, we've been uh, working very closely um, with a, uh, um, a clinical trial group to draft the uh, plans to, to move this into trials. Um, and so that's coming along really well, and, and we have our, our plans almost uh, fully um, developed. Uh, we've also been working with manufacturers to develop a, an in-depth manufacturing plan, um, and we've been working very closely with patent lawyers uh, to make sure that uh, you know we maintain a very strong um, blocking position with uh, with freedom to operate. And so we just opened a um, convertible note uh, for the company uh, just a few weeks ago, and and we've been raising money, and and um, yeah, we're in, in the process of moving. Uh, Moving things uh, full speed ahead, we're we're in the process of uh, you know starting to hire uh, full time employees, and we have a really exceptional CEO, Nancy Briefs, who I've known for for quite some time, probably over over ten years, um, and she has really deep experience in the uh, you know in the med tech biotech industry. Um, she's uh, been CEO of many companies, many successful exits, and um, just a really wonderful person. Uh, to work with, and so yeah, we're we're moving this full speed ahead. What what's going to be your model? Do you have to test this in mice, for instance, or because there's a similar uh, substance that has proven to be safe? Does that give you any fast track to test this in people first? Yeah, so because we're we're basing this on a um, on on a drug that already exists, and, and the modifications we're making are very very minimal. Um, uh, we believe we're in a good position to uh, accelerate through uh, clinical development. I think, you know, our path is shorter because we're advancing through this uh, 505 B2 path. Um, we think that we can get to, you know, once we have the right funding in place, uh, within about four, four and a half years, uh, we can um, get all the way to the end of phase two. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, um, that's currently where we're headed. Excellent. Well, Jeff, what's what's the best way for people to uh, get in touch or to ask questions? What are some resources for them? Yeah, I would encourage people to uh, to check out uh, the website, Altrix Bio. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be constantly updating the information there. Um, and, you know, as we build the team and, and, and hit milestones, and we'll also have uh, an email contact there if people want to ask questions or want to be, um, you know, added to our database so we can keep people um, you know, posted with our clinical development plans and also potential to participate in trials. Well, very good. Well, Jeff, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been a really interesting call. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, this has been great. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, 
medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.